Practical principles in using apologetics. Number one, we want to avoid interrogating the other person with questions. When we're saying what and why, we don't want this just to be what, why, what, why, what, why. We're giving a back and forth as we talked about before. We want to follow the, what's called the one and done rule. If the other person concedes to a point that you made or says that's a really good point or I agree even, you don't go for two. If they say, wow, fine-tuning is really good evidence for God, you don't say, well, abiogenesis, do you know how many cells you need to... No, 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 you just stop right there and you say, yeah, and you wouldn't believe there's more than that we could look into. You want to think about it when you're talking to the person, not in a contentious way or a contrarian way, but that we're both sitting on the same team, on the same side of the table, so to speak, and it isn't that it's me versus them, but it's like we're both looking at this together, instead of me arguing, it's me saying, let's look at this together. So instead of being face-to-face, like a face-off, like a bunch of old Western cowboys ready to shoot each other, it's shoulder-to-shoulder. We're exploring this together. Instead of declaring, it's sharing. And instead of presentations, we're having conversations. You need to get this into your mind. I know we're using really pithy words and we're rhyming, sharing and declaring, okay? I I hope the thought is getting into your mind. I'm not here to battle this person. I'm not here to pin them into submission. Again, you're holding the royal flesh. I'm not worried about you losing an argument. I'm worried about you losing a person. So this could look something like this. You know, if we're just a collection of chemicals and juices, what gives us value? You know, that always used to bother me. This is how I see it. What do you think? So you're not trying to play gotcha. You ever seen that happen? This was the old uh, Cornelius Van Til apologetic, presuppositional apologetics. Francis Schaeffer's mentor. It was very harsh, very cold. And Schaeffer, if you ever read his stuff, he was very into love. Loving the other person. Love, love, love. He broke from Van Til on that. And it was in this way, it was in this conversational approach that, that you know, I kind of see it this way. What do you think? Rather than trying to catch the person in making an absurd claim. If everything in the universe is controlled by natural law, then how can we say that evil and suffering are unnatural? So you could hit them with that, but you could also follow it up with, now see, I find that problematic. And I'm, I'm sure you do too, you know what I mean? Because like, we know evil's real. We know suffering is wrong. But, but uh, this is how I see it. So you're not trying to pin the person. You're on the same team. You want to let them save face. Save face. So instead of asking, do you believe the Holocaust was evil? They might double down and say no. What a completely stupid, not to mention a moral thing to say. The Holocaust was not evil? How about letting them save face and not pinning them, not going, gotcha? How about this? I'm sure you'd agree the Holocaust was evil, right? Isn't that a much uh, more winsome way to talk to the person? Do you think free will is an illusion? They might double down and say, yes, I do think it's an illusion. Just because they're being stubborn or they're trying to hold to their view. They, They planted their flag. How about this? I'm sure you'd agree that we are in control of our own thoughts, right? I mean, you could even smile. I mean, otherwise, what are we doing here? Having a conversation? Why are we using reason if we're determined to pick the choices that we're going to make anyways? There's no point of even talking. It's just who yells the loudest, you know? Discern the different species of doubt. My grandfather served in... World War II on the Eastern Front, and he flew in those B-52s, you know, bucket of bolts, you know, real scary. He developed a fear of heights, and for years, he refused to fly. And after decades, he always wanted to go back to his homeland, Ireland. And he had first cousins there. His father was born there. Finally, at the age of 70-something, He decided he's going to get over his fear. He's going to buy a ticket. He's going to get on the plane. And he's going to fly over to Ireland. He gets over there. And within two weeks, they had torn down the house in which his father was born. Now, if 
you talked to my grandfather who has passed. And you said, Bob, you know what the chances are of a plane going down? You'd have to fly every day for 14,000 years to die in a plane crash. You wouldn't believe these planes. You know all the servicing that goes into them and the checks that they do? I mean, if you gave my grandpa a hundred different arguments for why air travel is safe, would that have helped him with presumably the post-traumatic stress disorder he had from serving in World War II? Think about it like this. The Psychology of Atheism. This is a book written by Paul Witz. He was a Freudian psychologist. He wrote the book, Faith of the Fatherless. Witz was trained under Freud, and Freud said that religious belief was a projection of a father figure in the sky to help us deal with our insecurity and guilt. And so we want there to be a father figure in the sky, and Freud said that that's the origin of religion. Civilization and its discontents, you can read about this. Witz, who was trained as a Freudian psychologist, pulled a Freud on Freud. And he said it isn't that Christians are projecting God as a father figure, but atheists are rejecting God as a father figure. And so he studied the top first generation atheistic thinkers since the Enlightenment up until the late 90s. He found that their fathers were absent, abusive, or apathetic. Friedrich Nietzsche, his father, died at the age of four. Bertrand Russell, his father, died at the age of four. Arthur Schopenhauer, his father, died by suicide when Arthur was 17 years old. Camus, his father, died at age one. Sartre died at age one. David Hume, the great skeptic, his father died at age two. Thomas Hobbes, his father was a clergyman. He was an ignorant gambler with a violent temper who killed a man on the way into church and fled, never to return. Samuel Butler, his father was a Christian clergyman who would terrorize and beat him and his family. Fitz writes on page 44, he in return could recall no time when he didn't fear and dislike his father. Ludwig Feuerbach, his father cheated on his mother with a family friend when he was nine. He left the family for the mistress, fathering a boy with the mistress and naming the child after himself. Voltaire preferred to be considered illegitimate rather than the son of his biological father. Witz couldn't get at the historical reasons why. He wouldn't write about him. He just said, I'd rather be called an illegitimate kid than have the name of that guy. Madeline Marie O'Hare, honestly, a mean woman. Like, I'm not saying that in a pejorative sense. She was mean. She was the head of the American atheists. Her son became a Christian. And her son wrote a biography in which he said, Madeline Murray O'Hare's father came over to the house and Madeline Murray O'Hare grabbed a 10-inch butcher knife and chased her dad around the house saying, quote, I'll see you dead. I'll get you yet. I'll walk on your grave. What about Sigmund Freud? His father was bullied by anti-Semites. They would knock off his hat, call him racial epithets and, you know, uh, Jewish epithets. And in his personal letters later in life, he said his father sexually molested him and his siblings. H.G. Wells, his father was a heavy drinker, gambled the family's money. The mother had to run the family business while dad played cricket. Richard Dawkins, this doesn't come up in the book because this is published before The God Delusion in 2006. He admits in the book in a very cavalier way that his teachers at his boarding school molested him. Stuck their hand down his pants and molested all the other boys in the school. He's come under fire for this because he's, he's basically downplaying sexual molestation. He said, yeah, it wasn't that big of a deal. Christopher Hitchens, the other one of the four horsemen of the new atheism, his mother left his father for an ex-clergyman. Mom and the lover, the ex-priest, made a suicide pact and young Christopher at the age of 17 had to go identify the body. What are we saying here? Psychological evidence doesn't prove or disprove the existence of God. You could say, well, we found a part in the brain that lights up when you have religious experience. That doesn't prove a thing. Nothing. Zero. Well, we can show why people come to their beliefs. That's the genetic fallacy, showing the origin of their beliefs, not whether their beliefs are true. This doesn't prove God or disprove God. 
Freud wasn't right. Bits isn't right. But Bits is honest. Bits is saying, I'm not trying to show that I'm right. I'm just trying to show that Freud was wrong. That's his point. The purpose here is this. This is not for apologetics. This is for compassion. When we see people that are so skeptical, so, so much vitriol, so much anger, we have to explore, are there other species of doubt rather than just purely intellectual? And friends, I've seen this time and time and time again. I'll give you one example. One guy came out to our group, was antagonistic, uh, would interrupt during the teachings, was kind of a type A bruiser. We became friends, and after about six months, I said, tell me about your family. He said, well, there's not much to say. I said, why? Uh, my mom and my dad both died in a car accident when I was nine. There's different species of doubt rather than just the intellectual. Speak to the core desires of people. Let me put it this way. Not just that what we're saying is true, but what we're saying is beautiful. Not just that what we're saying has good reasons behind it, but that you would want it to be reasonable. You know who's really good at this? C.S. Lewis. You would read parts of his books and you would just say, I don't know if this is true, but God, I want it to be. Tim Keller uses this very effectively in his preaching. You know, uh, I remember Keller saying something to this effect, I can't remember, but something like this. I understand if someone didn't believe in heaven. I understand that. But I have no idea why they wouldn't want it to be true. And you can substitute any beautiful part of the Christian worldview into that blank. You know, I understand if someone didn't believe that we could be forgiven of all of our guilt but I have no idea why they wouldn't want to be forgiven. You know, people are searching their whole lives for acceptance, for love, for security. It's all true. We have it. And speaking about this in a way that's desirable, listen, listen to Tim Keller, you'll pick up on it. Every teaching he does this, he basically uh, brings you in to the point where you're saying, I really wish this was true. I really hope it's true. Memorize key facts. This gives you so much credibility when you speak. So imagine if I said this. We have a lot more manuscripts in the New Testament than any other ancient text. Is that persuasive? Answer, no. But what if I said, okay, I hear you, but for Tacitus, the early 2nd century Roman historian, we have a total of 36 manuscripts for Tacitus. But for the New Testament documents, we have 5,836. Is that more persuasive? All of a sudden, that person's going to be gone. She knows what she's talking about. He knows what he's talking about. The fine-tuning of the universe is really, I mean, it's really astronomical. Is that persuasive? No. But to say the gravitational constant, that's the uh, uh, force G between two masses, uh, M1 and M2, um, that force is finely tuned to one part in 10 raised to the 40th power. And just to give you an idea, the number of seconds in the universe is 10 to the 18th power. Is that persuasive? Even non-Christians believe in Jesus. Eh. What if you said, Gerd Ludemann, the atheistic German historian, said that the death of Jesus is indisputable, quote-unquote. They're going to be going, Gerd Ludemann? What is that, a, like an acid reflux disease? What is <laughs> yeah. Memorizing key facts, that's going to be your homework for this week. Don't be pigeonholed. Don't be pigeonholed. You know what a pigeonhole is? Of course you don't. That's why I brought a picture. <laughs> a pigeon can get into a hole the size of its head. So it squeezes in there. And so basically, when people speak to you, they want to squeeze you into uh, a, a box. They want to put your view to make it seem very uh, a straw man, uh, uh, reductionistic, not nuanced. They want a yes or a no, true or false. For complex questions, some people feel like, well, I have to give them a yes or a no. Did you know that for complex questions, if you give them a yes or a no, that is actually unclear communication? Jesus, when he was asked, should we pay the, the tax or no? Not the temple tax, the Roman tax. What does he say? Yes? No? Oh, I guess Jesus just wasn't being honest. No, it was a trap. It was a complex question. They wanted a soundbite 
So they could skewer him on this side of the dilemma or skewer him on that side of the dilemma. And he split the horns of the dilemma. And he said, whose image is that? Render under Caesar what is Caesar's, what is God's, what is God's. You get the idea. Okay. Imagine someone comes up to you and says this. Do you think we should have dropped the bomb on Hiroshima and Nagasaki in World War II? Yes or no? If you say, yes, I think we should have, they'd show you the 200,000 innocent civilians and the skin melted off their, their body and say, what are you, a moral monster that we would do that? Yes? You say, wait, wait, no, 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 never mind, sorry. No, we shouldn't have dropped the bomb in Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And they say, wait a minute. All the reports said that if we didn't drop the bomb, there would have been millions of casualties both for the Japanese and the Americans. It would have extended World War II for a decade. More civilians would have been killed, and it would have been a nightmare that would have prolonged forever. What are you, a moral monster? You see the point? If you gave a yes or no to this question without giving your reasons why, it would result in people thinking it would be unclear communication. I hope you can get that idea. So what about this question? This is the modern question of our day. Do you believe that same-sex marriage is wrong? And they want a soundbite. They want, they want to put you into a bigoted, fundamentalist, mean-spirited, hateful caricature. That's what they want. I won't let that happen. And you might say, well, you're going to be like a politician here speaking around this. No, I'm going, actually going to speak my view with clarity, but that's going to take some time. I have five answers that I think help this. Number one, our culture really lacks nuance on this issue and it's really alienating to discuss. We either need to agree with people and love them or disagree with people and hate them. From my perspective, I seek to actually love people with whom I disagree. But that doesn't always mean I affirm their views. What I like about this answer is it shows that I'm loving, I care, I'm not a bigot, I'm not being put into a box where people are going to caricature me, and I'm actually saying this is a nuanced discussion. Or answer number two, I hear that question often, I know people ask it for different reasons. What's our first rule? What? What makes you ask that question? Maybe you're bringing something personal to the table. The reason I like this answer is because I'm trying to love the person with whom I'm speaking. I'm trying to get into their world and know what they've been through. Did you know that there was a young woman that came here to our summer institute and spoke out and she was so angry? And afterward, uh, I won't say who it was, but one of our speakers went up to her in a, in a very kind way and talked to her and she said, you know, I'm just angry, I'm angry. Well, why are you angry? And she said, well, because at my church... My sister is a lesbian, and the pastor found out, and he brought her up on stage in front of 500 people and prayed the demon of lesbianism out of her. That is sick. That is twisted. That is spiritual abuse. So, answering this in a way that's going to get at that history of the person. You know, some people think that morality is relative. How about this? If morality is relative, you know, it's kind of hard to have ethical discussions about right and wrong. Do you believe that morality is real? And if so, where does it come from? This would be a good response. Why? Because how can we have a discussion about ethics if we don't affirm ethics? How can we have a moral discussion if we don't believe in morality? And I actually want to lay the foundation for, do you believe in right and wrong? Before we start having an esoteric ethical discussion. A fourth answer, I believe in what Jesus taught regarding God's design for marriage in Matthew 19 and Mark 10, respectively. Jesus believed that God's design for marriage was between one man and one woman for one lifetime. And he cited Genesis 1.27 and Genesis 2.24. The reason I like this answer goes back to the old children's song, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. If I'm going to go down... I want to go down with Jesus' view. 
we met with uh, John Lennox when he was here, and he was interviewed, and the atheistic woman that was interviewing him said, where, where do you stand on this issue? And he said, that's a very good question. Let me open up my Bible. And he just started to read from Matthew 19. And she raised her voice at him. He said, wait, let me explain my view. And she raised her voice. Well, finally, the director came in and shut down the radio show. And she had to issue a public apology the next day because he was just reading from the scriptures. Or answer number five, you know, I hate it when Christians give glib or superficial answers to complex questions. You know, that subject that you just raised is so important. It's ripping our culture apart. It's hurting people's lives. And in order to really talk about this, we need to have a dialogue. I wouldn't want to just shove my views down your throat. Do you have time to hear like a robust, thoughtful response on this? Isn't that better than being pigeonholed? And I want you to remember this. I'm using this as one example. For any, any subject where someone is trying to get a yes or a no and paint you in such a way that makes you look like something that you're not, it would be wrong for you just to say yes or no. You're communicating more accurately when you give a thoughtful response. Share stories and experiences. So if somebody's saying, you know, the problem of evil, you could give some kind of a theodicy or philosophical defense, or you could say, I've been through suffering. I remember when that tested my faith. Or somebody's saying, I'm reading this in the Bible, and I, you know, I'm looking at it, and I'm having a hard time believing this. You could say, I remember the first time I read about the flood. I had a really hard time with that. I know exactly what you mean. And you can empathize and share your experience with people in that way. Well, let's conclude here. Have small responses to big questions. This is going to contradict everything I just said. It's basically giving you a little pithy response to every single question. But here's my point. There's sometimes when you ask what, and you affirm, and you ask why, and you don't get pigeonholed. And then there's sometimes where you just have to plant your feet and you need to argue like a thrashing floor. Okay? Now, wouldn't you feel better if when somebody hit you with a question from left field, if you had a time machine and you could go back and study that question before they asked it? We just did, okay? We just went back to September. What's the date today? September. September 1st. <laughs> and uh, September 4th, someone's going to ask you a question, and you're going to wish that you had studied it tonight, okay? And you have the opportunity to get ahead of it. I'll give you a few examples of how I would respond. Short, sweet. I think all paths are equally valid. Now, wait a minute. If you've studied religions for even five minutes, you know that they have fundamental contradictions. For example, Islam says in Surah 9, Ayah 30, that Jesus was not the Son of God. The New Testament says that that is the essential thing that you need to believe. Surah 4, Ayah 157 says that uh, Jesus never died on the cross. The New Testament says that he does. So which is true? All paths can't be equally valid. What if I told you I was going to give you directions and I just said, any path to Cleveland will get you there? That'd be actually mean to do. And why would we apply some kind of a view like this when it comes to the ultimate questions of life when we wouldn't apply it to any other area of life? I memorized that response, okay? If you couldn't tell. That's just your interpretation. That's just your interpretation. That's right. That is my interpretation. Can you show me where I got it wrong? Short, sweet, to the point. That, you're correct. That is my interpretation of the text. Can you show me where I got it wrong? Where did I make a misstep? What about this one? Are you saying my grandma is in hell? My buddy got asked this. You know, in Luke 23, there was a thief on the cross, and for all intents and purposes, I bet his family thought that he went to hell. But according to that passage, he turned to Jesus in his final moments and came to him, and Jesus said, today you will be with me in paradise. So I don't know where your grandmother is, but I do know that Jesus will take people right up until the final moments, and we don't know if she called out to him. What I will say is that there's nothing that you can change about what happened with your grandmother and your family in the past, but your decision for Christ will have incredible impact on your kids and your grandkids in the future. Hitler was a Christian. You know what the short and sweet response to this is? You don't get into the history. You know what you say? I have a hard time believing that Hitler worshipped a Jew. <laughs> I stole that from Frank Turek. 
He's, he's the king of these, real quick. How about this one? Bertrand Russell asked this years ago, the great uh, agnostic philosopher. He said, what would you say to the little child dying of cancer? I thought, wow. I remember reading that, you know, uh, why I'm not a Christian. What would you say to that little child dying of cancer? Until it struck me. Mr. Russell, what would you say to that child? I would say, you're about to go into eternal life. I would say, this suffering has a purpose. I would say, God is here to comfort you in all sufferings. I would say, you're surrounded by people in the mystical union of the body of Christ. What would you say? Oh, what does he say in his uh, free man's worship? We need to cling with unyielding despair. That's what Russell would say to the little child. Hey, little sweetie, we need to cling to unyielding despair. <laughs> oh, the Christian answer is so much better. What about the person who never heard the gospel? Three E's. God has not revealed himself equally. He didn't write John 3.16 on the moon, but then again, he couldn't because uh, what language would he write it in? English? What about the nearsighted? What about the blind? What about the illiterate? I don't think he can reveal himself equally, but I do believe he revealed himself enough. Romans 1.20 says that since the beginning of the world, his divine attributes have been known, blah, blah, blah. He's made it known in, in them, whether in creation or conscience. So he's revealed himself enough. And to those who seek him, he will reveal himself extra. Matthew 7, 7, seek and you will find, knock, it shall be opened. Threes. Equal? No, but I don't think that's even possible. Enough and extra. Finally, science contradicts the Bible. No, it does not. Do you know what contradicts the Bible? Naturalism. Naturalism. Naturalistic science contradicts the Bible. If you believe that nature is all that there is, you don't believe in God. You don't believe in angels. You don't believe in the Son of God. You don't believe in miracles. That would contradict the Bible. But science is the investigation of what is. By definition, it can't contradict the Bible. It can't contradict something which is metaphysical because it only studies the physical. That would be like a, a, a gearhead, a, a car mechanic, trying to disprove the existence of Henry Ford by pulling apart a car. Uh, it's just a category error. It's not even in the same ballpark. What I will say is this. The Bible has difficulties in it on the periphery. The global flood, uh, universal progenitorship of Adam and Eve, so on and so forth. Those are difficulties. I get it. They're difficulties. You're right. You're right. You're right. But at the core, the Bible is rock solid. It gives us the answers to cosmology, to fine-tuning, to abiogenesis, to free will, to morality, to the existence of Jesus, to... <laughs> At the core, our worldview is unbelievable. Atheism is completely flipped. On the periphery, atheists have the best one-liners. They've got the best memes. Superficially, atheism looks great on the skin. In the core, it is completely vacuous. How do you deal with suffering? We don't. What's your meaning in life? We die. What's the purpose of life? There is none. How do you explain the beginning of the universe? We have no explanation. What about fine-tuning, the multiverse? How much evidence is there for that? Zero. Maybe we'll learn it in the future. No, in principle, we'll never find evidence for this. Um, so in the core, they're completely defunct. And all they like to do is say, well, what about the flood? What about this? At the core of our faith, we are rock solid. 